turning over to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Uh, we're going to... I'm not going to look at this entire chapter. This chapter deals with David's mighty men. I'm not going to look at this entire chapter. I'm just going to look at a thought from this chapter. And we're going to... Uh, try to challenge ourselves with just an example of three men. Three men here mentioned. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23 records for us the... Uh, is that on? No. Okay, the battery must be dead. So we'll just pretend that it's on. All right? And uh, so uh, uh, 2 Samuel records for us the uh, last words, uh, some of the last words of David. And, it, and also in that same chapter it gives us the the account of uh, the mighty men of David. And also, if you wouldn't care, step back there in my office and grab a battery out of the top of the file. I came to the very top drawer, a 9-volt battery. Uh, David's mighty men and the last words that of David are recorded in the same chapter here. And it says in chapter 23, beginning at verse 8, it says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. And it has here... All the way down through the end of the chapter, the, the, the name of these mighty men. By the way, I want you to notice the last verse, verse 39. Notice this very, the name that's mentioned there, Uriah the Hittite. You know who Uriah was? This is Bathsheba's husband. This is the man that David had killed. He was one of David's mighty men. And you say, I don't understand what mighty men mean. Well, let's just start back up here about chapter, I mean, verse 8, and let's just see what the Bible says. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tatnamite whom sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adonai, the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. So this particular mighty man slew 800 men at one time by himself. That's a mighty man. Amen? And, and then we said in verse 9 it says, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahite, and one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were gathered, thanks sir, uh, that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. The Bible says he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword, and the Lord brought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So we have a, another story of a mighty man here whom fought, the Bible says in verse 9, Eleazar, a three, one of three of mighty men of David, whom he, they defied the Philistines. What in the world is going on here? All right. And then I don't know where I'm going. There's a problem. And, uh, all right, let's try that. Is that any better, Jacob? All right. That's what I'm going on, bringing stuff. And uh, so, uh, so he said that in verse 9, we'll do this again. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahite, one of the three mighty men of David, whom they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. So we have here Eleazar, one of three, it says in verse 10, who arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So we have here the, the story where the people, the Philistines were there. Eleazar had to face the Philistines and he fought them until he was completely exhausted. He was completely worn out. And his hand, the Bible says, was so weary from holding the sword, but yet he claimed the sword, even in his exhaustion, continued to fight, and after him he, he brought a great victory. And after this battle, the people that were returned to have the spoil of the victory. The Bible says in verse 10, He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword. So even when he was tired, how many of you have ever been so tired? I, I, I've done this many times, and Jacob and I have worked together several times, and he's even said to me before that, I'm, I'm, I'm so, my hand's so tired of holding this that, that it's cramped to it. <laughs> you ever had your hand, you've been holding, sanding on something, carrying something, digging with something, and your hand cramped up, literally cramped to the item that you, you couldn't let it go. You wanted to hurt <laughs> This is the story. This guy was so exhausted, so tired, he continued to fight even though he was weary. His hand claimed to the sword, and the Lord brought a great victory that day. So even when he was discomforted, even when life wasn't good, even when he had no help, he fought. And then the people enjoyed the spoil. Look at verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agai, the Hattite. And the Philistines were gathered together and go true. 
There was a place ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. We're going to stop right there tonight. We're going to focus upon this last one. We looked at these others. But I want to remind you real quickly that Uriah here is one of these mighty men. We're going to talk about, we've already talked about three, and we're going to emphasize one of the three in a moment. But you think about the, what God did with these men, and the battles that was won, and the, and the Philistines that was slain, and, and, and how God gave the increase over again because there were some men that proved themselves to be mighty. And it's not that their strength, but they trust the Lord, and, and they fought for the king. They didn't defy the king. They fought for the king. He was God's chosen man. Was the king perfect? Of course the king wasn't perfect. There's never been a man perfect upon the earth apart from Christ himself, the God-man. He wasn't perfect, and we know he wasn't perfect. Matter of fact, he killed one of his own mighty men. <laughs> You're right. But these men fought for the king. They fought for the glory of the Lord. And I want you to, we're going to hang on to this. In verse 11, we're going to think about this. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herite. And the Philistines, notice this, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. So they wasn't just scattered out. They purposely planned a tactic. They've got a plan. They put themselves together in a group, in a, in a troop. And now, with this troop, there is a piece of land that is full of lentils. <clears throat> Lentil just being a, a type of bean. A bean field, how's that? And these Philistines come where God's people were in this field of beans. And the Philistines came with a troop to overtake and take this bean field from them. It's just a bean field. And we would say, some <coughs> things are just not worth fighting for. I agree, but some things are. And some things always will be. And this bean field may just been a bean field that's out, but listen, the very substance of life was in this field. The Bible says they, there was a troop of the Philistines that came together and, and they were gathered into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from Philistines. Naturally they did. The people wasn't warriors. <laughs> so the people fled and the Philistines now are going to gain this piece of ground. They're going to, they're going to get this piece of ground. They're going to achieve victory this being field. But notice this. Verse 12. But he stood. Who? Shama. <laughs> Verse 11. And after him was Shama. He stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord brought a great victory. Here's, here's, the, here's the thought tonight. Very simple. We'll try to make it short. What is it that you're fighting for? And if you're fighting for it today, then it's worth fighting for tomorrow. And if you're not willing to fight for it today, then what makes you think you'll be willing to fight for it tomorrow? Because up until now, the people, as far as we know, they've just been able to have this bean field, and, and this bean field is just there, and this piece of land is just there, and they've been able to enjoy it kind of freely. And it was kind of a haven because there was sustenance of life there, there, there was comfort there, they could be sustained, everything was good, and they had just been there, and they had realized that it was a blessing of God. But the day came when someone tried to take it from them. And they fled. But Shaman did. He didn't flee. He stood. Here's the difference. We, we've used this illustration in the past, and I'm going to use it in mind. Where we sit today is where we'll plant our feet. We need to stand tomorrow. Where we sit today in comfort is where we plant our feet. We need to stand tomorrow. Our country, we have sat in comfort so long that we forgot to stand. We have forgotten to stand. We've sat in comfort so long. Our country has been blessed of God. There's no doubt about it. God has blessed this land in, in marvelous, miraculous ways over and over and over again. And quickly we're forgetting to take that stand. And quickly we're giving up 
our ground. You know the Roe versus Wade campaign about abortion back in the 70s? I tell you, the part I don't like about that was a lot of them, I don't really like any part of it, but one of the really parts I don't like is the Roe part was the abortive side of things. I don't like that. That's my last name. Spelled the same exact way. Let me show you something. But if you research it out, really it was just someone at that campaign hired and paid to use as an example. Later, she turned and said, I don't agree with this decision, but too late. Too late, the courts had already made a decision and it has not been overturned since. Now praise God for it. We've got some great people in our state that have fought hard against abortion laws. And our state is not by far the most liberal state when it comes to abortion laws. We have some pretty strong laws, as strong as I guess any state in the land can be as far as that, without it being completely set aside. And we're starting to slip a little bit on that too. Some of those that once stood are no longer standing. Some of the supporters are no longer supporting. We've got some great people in our state that made a great stand for abortion and, and for the life of the unborn, not a great stand for abortion, but for the life of the unborn against abortion. And they made a great stand. But here's the thing about it. If this young lady had a disagreement with aborting a baby, she should not have allowed anyone to use her for the other cause. Because she may want to stand up later. By the way, she did. She, there's interviews. You can find them. You can read them. There's interviews. She, done where she said, I don't agree with this. Too late. She'd already given up the field. She'd already fled. The field had already been overtaken by reckless judgments. And it's not been taken back yet. Oh, we may be getting in the edges of it a little bit. We may be stopping late term abortions. And we may be putting some things in place as far as they have to wait a certain period of time. They can't just walk in and have a child aborted that day. It has to be a few hours at least for them to consider the thoughts and some counseling. But we've not gotten that field back because we didn't stand there. We had sat too long. And comfort. And we didn't stand what we needed to stand. What about prayer? Remember when prayer was taken out of the schools? It made a big made the news, didn't it? You know why it's taken out of schools? Because it's taken out of the home first. We had already let it go in the home first. And therefore we had sat back and sat on our hands and twiddled our thumbs and we had sat so that we just sat right through the battle. And all of a sudden we realized, What? Too late. The field had already been taken. It had already been taken. Can we take it back? Sure we can. It's going to take a lot of fighting to get it back. Because the troops of the other side have their self-anchor there. They're rooted there. The same with abortion. What about our country as far as the sanctity of marriage and what defines a marriage? Who would have ever thought just five years ago that our country, the United States of America, one nation under God, supposedly, would make a nationwide decision that men and men could be legally married. That women and women could be legally married. Just this week in the state of Arizona, a custody case about two women that were married that had a baby artificially inseminated, they have since split, divorced, whatever you want to call it, and they was in court battling custody of this child. And guess what? The courts awarded custody to both parties because the state said, the, the government says, they're legally married just like anyone else is. Now think about this. They may have been divorced, they have the same legal rights. Five years ago, not 50 years ago, five years ago, who would have thought that was possible? We've given up our bean field. <laughs> Honestly. We've let people come in and overrun and take, and we just sat back and we say, I'm not, I, I don't see what's happening. It's because we're fleeing. We're fleeing. Our churches, let me just get to that point real quickly. Our churches are quit preaching against sin because it may offend someone. And we've given up our being fear. Our churches have given up membership, therefore there's no accountability for a lifestyle. Churches often don't even have pastors on property anymore. They have a video screen with a 
feed from some other place, a video feed from some other city, some other place, they have no accountability, no membership. Pastors have no relationship with the people because they just don't want to be bothered and I don't want to know much because you know, I, I just don't want to deal with that. I just, don't want to, I just don't want to be involved in that. That's a pastor's job. And if we're not going to be able to do those things and invest in people's lives, then don't be a pastor. I'm not being nasty, but we've let our bean field just get overran. Notice this real quick. Someone said, this, is, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. Why, this doesn't make any sense. Why would, why would this man risk his life and, and limb for a bean field? Wait a minute. I remind you, just like with the previous mighty man of God, of God that he gave David, people reap the spoils for the stand of the mighty. These people fled the field, gave it up. He stood and fought and defeated because God gave a great victory. Guess who had got to enjoy the bean field after the victory? The people. So I say to us tonight, we have a generation of Lord Jesus coming that's following us. And we may not, our bean field may not be as big as it once was. We may have given up a lot of it. But whatever ground we've got left, let's stand firm on that ground. Biblically, scripturally, doctrine, we have it all intact. We have not been given, we've not given up any of that. Others may have given up their field, but we've not given up ours. Nationally. So we've given up some ground nationally. Then let's stand firm where we have now and let's pray to God. Let's pray that God will give us some increase. It's He that giveth the increase, the Bible says. Lord, we're just going to stand faithful where you put us. It may not be much, but little as much as God is in it. And when we know that you'll feed us, care for us, meet our needs, never have I seen the righteous forsaken, God see God see a baby bread. And we're just going to remain faithful. God, we're going to pray you're going to give us you're going to give us some field back, some more land back. We're just going to remain faithful. We're going to ask for we're going to ask God to do something. Not just do something, but do something that we gave up. God, we're sorry, we're repentant. Lord, I, I, we should never give it up, but we have got to take it back. The Bible says this, redeeming the time. You understand what that means? Redeeming means buying back. It doesn't just mean salvaging what's here. It means buying back the time. You say, well, you can't turn the clock backwards. No. We can gain some of the doctrine that we've given up in times gone by back. We can teach people that doctrine that they've been stolen, had stolen away from them through false teachers who, by the way, in the last days are abundance of. We, we've got to realize, notice this, and I'm, I, I'm going to, not going to harp on this long, but we have, the Bible says he stood in the midst of it. He didn't just run to the other side. He said, well, let's all get out of here. And then everybody else said, I'm going to stand right here, right on the edge. You all better get out of this field. Go, shoot, shoot, shoot. No. He stood in the midst of the field. He didn't run to the edge and give him a plan of escape. He stood in the midst of the field. No reservation. No retreat. <laughs> he stood in the midst of this field, the Bible says, and defended it. And defended it. He was just defending what God had already given him. He wasn't trying to take anybody else's. He was just defending what God had already given. I said on Monday night or in this little Bible, I said we have a real issue in our, in our nation about men and fathers not being involved in their family's lives. And as a result of that, we've raised not just this generation, but multiple generations where even if the marriage was intact, which by the way, over half of them fail. It's over 50% now. By the way, that's not just out of the church. That number's in the church as well. But even if a marriage remains intact, often the father has no plays no role in the life of the kids. And if it is a role, 
It's a role of arrogance. It's a role of nonsense. It's a role of supporting all the wrong things and not putting enough support on the right things. Hey, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with 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 a with a, a dad wanting to be involved with his kids being involved in sports. But sports should never take the place of church. And that ought to lead and take his family to church, not just send or see they go there. There's nothing wrong with that when he take his, his children and get them involved in some activity or some training or some outdoor activity. And do that. But it shouldn't be every weekend we're off doing something and neglecting the things of God and the responsibility to God. Because what happens is we, we just do that. We, if we're not careful, we say, well, I'm going to teach them to be a man. Well, then teach them to be a God's man. Samuel, I mean Samson, the Bible says, God says to his parents, the child will be a man child. What? You mean we have to wait until it was born and let it get a few years old for it to determine if it, what its binary direction would be? And no. God said it's going to be a man child. And I'm going to use him to begin to deliver Israel. And he did. Now, did Samson, was he used of God as much as he could have been? Of course he wasn't. But he was used of God to begin to deliver Israel. God didn't lie. The battle at the end, when they were going to make a mockery of Samson, had a little child in him out, he, he prayed to God to revenge him of his eyes. And God gave him that strength one more time and he pushed the pillars over and he slew more than his death than he did in his life. He, get, he began to deliver Israel from the Philistines. God did not allow himself to be made a mockery of it. Samson may have made a mockery of the life that God gave him, but God wasn't made a mockery of it. We need to raise some men to be men, God's men. We need to raise some men to have an influence over their family, a godly influence over their family. And as a result of that, we teach them the right things and we teach them the right places. We teach them the Word of God. And, and in doing so, we instill a relationship with them to where they desire the right kind of man in their life, not just a man in their life. <coughs> My wife and I, we talk and joke about these things, about our girls and our son as well, but but, you know, we kind of have a little plan for Rebecca, you know, uh, that uh, she, if she's going to go to two years college, that we're going to introduce her to her future husband when she graduates high school. <laughs> and if she's going to go to four years college and she can't talk to anybody, we'll, we'll, we will introduce her to her future husband her, after her sophomore year of college because she's, gonna, she's on the two-year plan, you know. We kind of got a plan. We've already, we're going to direct this. We're going to pray to God to give us the answer, and then we're going to give, we're going to reveal it to her, you know. And she, she's not going to play these games and chase her around for six and eight years. And no, 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 we're going to, you know. <laughs> we joke and mess with our, our kids. If we don't, then who's going to, you know. Yes. And, uh, that's but the idea question. of being there, honestly, I want my girls as well as my son to be willing and able and know that they have the availability to talk to us if they do find someone they'd like to consider for a spouse. I don't want them just to walk up. I heard Brother Six at St. Chapel one time. He said he warned uh, some of the people in our chapel, young people, he said, listen, he said, some of you need to be careful. The first time that your parents ever meet your boyfriend or girlfriend is when you tell them they're, that you're engaged. <clears throat> he said, don't do that. Oh, he said it in a chapel of Bible college. Because we just lose focus, don't we? We get so, what do they call that? Cupcaking, is that what it's called? Oh, how many you know that term? I did not know that term. I know why I'm talking this term. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Here's cupcake in here, maybe. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> well, Aaron would go right up and done here. So, uh, and so, <laughs> so here's cupcake. Every man, they're not in class, 
that are meeting somewhere at a lunch table, at a break table, at a table outside, and they're just sitting in I never knew to do that. I didn't. Thank the Lord. And uh, I, honestly, but it just became, it, it's like we can find nothing wrong with the other person. Open your eyes. I promise there's something wrong with them. Everyone else sees it. Ask them. You know? But really, if we're not careful, we'll have so much potential from God to be used in our life to influence others, whether it be our children, whether it be other children, whether it be neighbors, whether it be co-workers, classmates. We have an opportunity to influence them for the cause of Christ and we just dismiss it. Our representatives of our states, not just this state, but states won't represent the people because it's too controversial. <laughs> well, then get out of Washington and come back to the state and get an honest job and let us send someone else there that will represent the people of this state. Right. That's what you're supposed to be, a representative. Well, we just believe that the national government will handle that. And you are supposed to be representing the states in the, on the national level. You remember the Civil War that now is a big, huge, controversial? I don't even know about the Civil War, by the way. Most of these people don't. The man number one called the Civil War was states' rights. It was not slavery. It was states' rights. And we have an amendment on our books that gives us states' rights. And we have representatives that want to represent the state. We have... We have Christians that will represent Christ, so why should we expect representatives to represent a state when we will represent our Heavenly Father? It would be so hypocritical for us to expect people to do their job if we're not doing the vo being faithful to vocation where with God called us. That's what he says, by the way, it's scriptural language. The vocation where with we've been called. So what, what are we doing with what God's given us to do? Well, it's just I just don't want to fight. I just I just don't want to fight. I just don't want to fight. I've met so many men, men. Bleh, when I feel like I'm going there when I talk to these guys, I say, "Well, I just don't. I just don't want to fight about it." Amen. Take a stand. I'm not talking just fight to be fighting. But take a stand for what's right. Some things you just got to set in order. That's why God said the husband is the head of the house. Somebody got to head up the house. And I, I know that we have all kinds of situations, but the reality of it is God set up an environment, a perfect environment from the very Garden of Eden where God said, I have an economy, I have a plan, I have a, I have a purpose, I have a vision. There's a, something that, we can, that can be done through man by God if we'll do it God's way and we just throw it all aside. Marriage is not marriage, biblically defined. Our country is not one nation under God. We're not united. Our churches are not preaching the truth. We're compromising on every turn and every corner. Pastors are not pastors. They're just hirelings. See, you're not in a good mood. Like, no, I'm feeling pretty good, actually. <laughs> I just want to stand in the midst of the field and fight. I'm not looking for a fight. But I don't want to give up the field. I don't want to give up the field. I think... God, for these people that have partnered with us, you know, those of you in our church that have partnered, and you said, I just want to fight. I was trying to tell young people this evening, and they prefer Ron Heather, I know that, and, and uh, to work with them and the youth, and Tommy probably prefers Ron Heather over to school, but you know what? They're out of town, so they got stuck with me, you know? <laughs> but here's what it boils down to. I was trying to tell them this evening, they're going to face a lot of obstacles in the next years of their life, moving from just a teenager to an adult from living in parents' house, living on their own, to living in dorms, to whatever, getting a job, paying the bills. They've got a lot of things that's going to cross their bridge. A lot of things. So start preparing now. Don't just sit back and wait on it, because it's not going to fall on your lap. It's going to fall like a building on you. You've got to prepare now. Don't be afraid to go forward for God now. 
when my wife and I and our three kids that were <clears throat> the tender ages of five, six, and ten years old left Tennessee, there was people crying. My pastor was crying. Our parents were crying. I had a man offer me money if he would not move. We had people that cared about us. We had a great home, a great church. I had a great job. It, life really was better than most people, most people probably ever had it, and we had it. I'm not lying. So why did we leave? I, I know this sounds absurd, and don't, don't take this wrong way. I don't want to say it was easy to leave, but we really just didn't think about staying. <laughs> you understand what I mean? I'm not going to say like we were excited, we just couldn't wait to get away from everything. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. We just never thought about staying. Because God said go. You know who we knew in the entire state? In the entire state of Arizona? Jane Becky Shannon, Brian and Luann, Steve Debbie Morris. In the entire state of Arizona. And then I was telling young people as they grew up, and they get out of their own. What's going to happen? People are going to start relying on them. Whether it be a family, whether it be co workers, if it's ministry, there are going to be people they minister to and for. <coughs> now we've had the privilege of living out here almost 12 years, and I know lots of people in this state. I know lots of people in this town. And I am nothing, please, let's clarify that right now. I am nothing and worth nothing. But by God and His grace, there are those that rely upon me to remain in the midst of this field. And there are those that rely upon you. There's a midst of a field that needs to be defended. We didn't fight for the field. We don't deserve the field. God gave us the field. And He just said, defend what I've given you. And we throw it aside. How many of you realize that what, what you allow to get started in its infant stages only grows bigger and stronger at in its adult stages? Right? right. You start a, if a young person starts dating a person, the wrong person, they didn't listen to mom, dad, uh, the biblical authority, well, they, uh, they start dating the wrong person with the wrong ideas. And they, and well, but, but, but mostly they're right. It's just these one or two little things. And those one or two little things are going to grow up just like the rest of them. And those one or two little things are going to be difficult areas. Because little baby giants still grow into giants. And they get a lot harder to fight when they're giants. Right? So we have to in, address things in their infancy. So if there's something that were to come up in our church, that were to try to divide us, that were to try to split us, that were to try to cause a problem, then we would need to address it quickly. That's the Bible way, by the way. Quickly, suddenly. Strike while the iron is hot. You know? And why? Let's go ahead and defeat the giant in this field. So that he doesn't have much influence and he can't take the field. Because it might just be that some of us have to do that. Is that right? And God may put some people in a place where they have to draw the sword. And there's six or eight hundred people that one person's got to defend off. And maybe some, maybe some people that's just doing what they're doing along with the company people that God's put them with. And the devil says, put that person on the front line and retreat like you're right. You say, no, that was David said that. And the devil worked through David to get it done. Right? But nevertheless, there are still names of mighty men. Uriah was no less a mighty man than any of these others we read about here. And here's the point. Right in the middle of this passage, he can say, so this means, this means, this means, this means, but he doesn't. He stopped and he says, you know what he did? He just defended the field. He defended the field. We need to defend our country. We need to defend what our country is founded upon. You know how to defend what our country is founded upon? Find out what it's founded upon. <laughs> we need to teach it. I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, or I don't mean to. I should say I don't want to embarrass. I'm thinking just for a moment. 
Daniel. I will ask a, public, a private question publicly, please. If I use you for an illustration, make sure would it embarrass you if I, I'll be gentle, I promise. Okay? My wife and I was talking to Miss Cheryl Manic yesterday. Shirley Man come in. She teaches the same school. She's a permanent sub at the same school where Miss Cheryl Hawkins teaches. Last year was Miss Cheryl's first job, first year teaching at that school. First year teaching in the States, actually. She's been teaching overseas, right? And she came back and she had The biggest handful of all classrooms last year. Would that be semi accurate? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty close. Yeah. 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 I've had a privilege, my wife and I've had a privilege to <coughs> visit with Miss Cheryl a few times. I'm not elevating her to point. Yeah, just bear with me for a moment. I'm not inflating her ego by any means. And we've been in her home a few times and She's just a normal person. How many of you know that about her? She's just a normal young lady. I mean, she lives her life, goes to work, buys groceries, fixes her car on the brakes, you know, whatever. She's just a normal person like the rest of us. She's not a super woman. She's just a godly woman. This year in her classroom, she's got a different classroom different class, we'll say, I think. I know there's a lot of things people can say, well, it's different kids, different ages, different whatever. Wait a minute. There's some things that Ms. Shore put in her life over the summer and some things she put in her classroom. Am I right? Yes. In her classroom that affects visually those in her classroom. There's things that she makes, statements that she makes that affects the ears of those in her classroom. Now, let me understand, she's probably way kinder than I am. <laughs> yeah, that's a given. And yet, Shirley Minnick said she went from the worst class in the school last year to the example of classes in the school this year. Amen. Let me show you something. I, I'm not going to credit Miss Cheryl for all of that, but I will credit the fact that she didn't just give up the leave thing. She read some things. She made some decisions, and she put them into action. Now that's a school classroom. Can we do that in a church? Seriously, can we do that in a church? Can we read some things and implement some things and let God give the increase? Some would say, I don't understand why you try to keep up with so many people. I don't know either. Other than it's just, why wouldn't I? <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but why wouldn't I? If I know someone that is hurting or sick, then why wouldn't I call and check on them? church. That I don't know them because they're a member of our church. They're a member of our community. So our missionaries, we send them a check every month. I know. And missions should not be about money. We partner with them in prayer and financial support. Not just financial support. So I like contacting them, calling them one of our legs on my heart. I've got a pastor that I've met one time, but I'll probably call him tomorrow because we're living on my heart today. That had a great influence on my daughter the one time that they met when we were in Indiana, her and Tommy and myself. Darrell Reeves. I don't really know anything about him. Other than he walked up to Rebecca and could not believe the pastor's daughter would be sitting on voluntarily on the front row. <laughs> trying to encourage her. Rebecca was so impressed with him that she purposely the next day said, Dad, I want you to meet him and 
took me, introduced me to him. A few weeks later, called me on a Sunday morning early. Hey, I just want to check on you all. Make sure I was praying for you. Can you do that me? I had him on my heart, my mind today. I thought, I'm going to call him probably tomorrow. I said, hey, I just want to check up on you. Sell things you want. Why would you do that? You know why? Because he's in the middle of a bean field. And there's people trying to get to it, and they're forming truths, and they're getting ideas, and they're trying to attack and take some of that land. And he just needs to know that somebody's there with him. There's just another mighty man in, another, in the middle of another bean field defending that bean field, too. And we all can be that person. Just defending our bean field. See, it's, it's a bean field, I know. And we get to eat there tomorrow and next week because we defend it today. So when they take it away, where are you going to feast? What are you going to eat? If the government were to become communist and we can now have no more public gatherings and no more promotion of the gospel in a public way, where are you going to feast next week if you don't defend your field today? Well, we'd have an underground church. You say that like it's easy. Yeah. If, can I say this and then we're finished? I'm sorry, I've already meant to be done. If we can't defend it in times of, can I use this word, peace? Then we think that we're going to defend it in time of turmoil. We're fools if we feel that way. If we, don't, if we can't stand today when it's relatively easy to stand, and we think that we would stand if it was all taken away, God will do something because we stand in the midst. We don't run over to the edge and say, I wish they would just go away. I just wish they'd go away. I just wish they'd no. We're going to stand in the midst of the field with our sword drawn, defending the field. When we come tonight, I thank you for what you've done with us. And God has helped us, Lord, through this passage to understand our position in you and our place of service upon this earth. Help our homes be strengthened. Help our churches be strengthened. Help our nation be strengthened. Lord, we have given up way too much ground for way too long. We have stood by idly with our swords on our side and our hands in our pockets. And we have watched and allowed the enemy to trample that which you've given us to feast upon. Lord, whatever remaineth, let us stand and defend it today. Your truth is unchanged. The word of God is settled forever, Lord, so we know that, that is unchanged. It's, it's undaunted. But yet, Lord, our freedoms, our witness, Lord, we've allowed it to be taken from us. We've given it up because we stood and sat idly by. Help us, Lord, to seek your face. We trust you for the things to come. We're asking you to keep us tonight by your, by your faith that we want to live and serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.